Welcome to Jewelry Week 2022. I'm JB Jones. And I'm Bella Naiman. And we're excited to share this year's 2022 virtual program with you here on our official YouTube page. Please go subscribe. And also head to our website at nycjewelryweek.com to check out all the amazing programs we have this year, both on Instagram, on our virtual page here on YouTube, and the ones we're doing in person in New York City. And I will now tell you a little bit about the upcoming program. Curator um, Emily Bannis from the RISD Museum of Art is going to be in conversation with artist jeweler Aaron Decker about a recent commission that he's working on. If you have any questions for Emily or Aaron, feel free to drop them in the chat and we'll make sure they get them. Thanks so much and enjoy the program. Well, welcome everyone to our talk. Uh, my name is Aaron Decker. I am a jeweler based out of Michigan. Uh, I went to Cranbrook for grad school and I currently work full-time as a product development manager for a company called Shinola Detroit. And I'm Emily Bannis. I'm the assistant curator of decorative arts and design at the Museum of Art at the Rhode Island School of Design in Providence, Rhode Island. And we wanted to say thank you for New York City Jewelry Week for featuring us and allowing us the opportunity and space to have this conversation in front of you all. Thank you if you're watching this. Um, and let's get this started. Yeah, let's do it. So I want to kick things off by talking about the RISD Museum's jewelry collection. Um, I'm really thrilled to get to share some information with you today and also to chat a little bit with Erin about a project that we are working on that I'm really excited about and then kind of have a conversation about curatorial and artistic practice and the ways in which we're both working. So to start things off, um, uh, um, the RISD Museum has a wonderful jewelry collection. We have about 1,500 objects that are classified as jewelry, and over half of that is in the Department of Decorative Arts and Design, and that consists of American and European jewelry from the medieval period all the way up to present day. We also have a spectacular collection of ancient jewelry, as well as Asian and Native American jewelry at the museum. For those of you who are not as familiar with the RISD and the RISD Museum, the museum and the college were founded at the same time in 1877 to really instruct students in the fundamentals of art and design. And the museum served as a space where students could see the types of objects and materials that they were learning about. Classes at the college, as well as the artwork collected by the museum, served to support the types of industries that were really thriving in Rhode Island, including textiles, silver, and of course, jewelry. RISD's jewelry collection came together over the course of the institution's history through various gifts and bequests, but very little research was done on the collection after it came in. Um, because I'm sure as some of you know, even though jewelry intersects with a lot of different disciplines like art and fashion and material culture, it tends to fall outside of the scope of knowledge for a lot of people working in these areas. And it was something that I really wanted to know more about. So um, there's so much about the collection I want to share, but for today's presentation, I'm just going to talk about a select group of objects and then the ways that I'm thinking about growing the collection. So I'm sure you're all dying to know about the two pieces on screen. Um, these are objects that have actually been housed in our ancient art department since they came into the museum. And there's still some debate about the necklace on the left, whether it's ancient, whether it's simply historic glass in a modern setting, um, but it's a really incredible piece. And it came into the museum as a bequest from a woman named Lyra Brown Nickerson. She was a wealthy Providence woman whose life was sadly cut short at the age of 31 when she contracted typhoid fever but she's known to have traveled really widely in Europe with her parents. And it's possible that the glass pieces in this necklace were purchased on a trip to Italy and later assembled when she got home. 
And what's so fascinating to me about this piece is that it looks, the setting looks straight out of mid 20th century studio jewelry. But in fact, this came into the museum's collection in 1916. So we know that it had to have been made prior to that date. And with Providence being such an important center for jewelry and silversmithing, it's possible that she could have come home and found someone to create this avant-garde design out of her souvenir glass. But um, we're, still, we're still researching. <laughs> um, the brooch on the right was once a mystery, but its story began to unfold when I started researching the marks on its setting. I have the next slide. As you can see, it's stamped Blanchard Cairo 18 carat. R.H. Blanchard or Ralph Huntington Blanchard was an American collector and dealer in Egyptian antiquities who was based in Cairo where he ran Blanchard's Egyptian Museum. Antiquities purchased from Blanchard's can be found in museums all around the world, but jewelry pieces like this are a little bit more unusual. According to our museum records, this brooch is a copy of a similar piece that was found in Queen Tai's tomb, and it used, quote, old beads in a reproduced mounting. So from the one or two examples that I found, it would appear that Blanchard was having new jewelry pieces created um, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries that incorporated ancient fragments that were being excavated that probably were not able to be used or sold on their own. And amazingly enough, the RISD Museum actually has a piece of ancient jewelry, this Roman earring that you see here, that was purchased from Blanchard's shop. And we still have the original receipt and the box for it, which was really exciting to find in storage. So save your boxes and your receipts. Next slide. Who doesn't love rings? Um, I certainly do. And we have a really fantastic collection at the museum. One of our other very early collections to come into the museum uh, came to us in 1913 from someone named Isaac Bates. And he was a Providence merchant in the late 19th century who had a great interest in art and uh, support of local artists. In fact, the RISD Museum has about 1,300 works of art that were gifted by Bates, and over 300 of those are jewelry. One of the most exciting aspects of this collection is the rings. And in a catalog about Bates's collection, it says that, quote, the rings were not selected at first with much regard to the country or period in which they were made, but they were picked up from time to time because of some beauty or ingenuity of design or clever workmanship. The field of interest was so broad, so the choice might be a Venetian jewel or a peasant ring from Bavaria." End quote. Like most of our jewelry collections, the majority of these rings are unmarked and given that styles and ideas and craftsmen traveled widely throughout Europe, we can't say with any certainty where most of these rings were made. However, we've made a lot of headway in dating these rings. And thanks to the fantastic work of our volunteer gemologist, Teresa Baybutt, we have been able to identify the gems and minerals in a lot of these pieces, which has given us a really great jumping off point for research. Can you get the next slide? Similar to our glass necklace from Lyra Brown Nickerson, we know that many of our jewelry pieces were souvenirs that were picked up during European travels, like these wonderful micro mosaics from Italy. There are other pieces though that have a more distinct and personal history that were likely made and passed down through generations of a family before ending up in the museum's care. Next slide. The earliest jewelry pieces that actually came into the museum came in in 1902. And those were jewelry that were made of or with hair. We often refer to these types of works as mourning jewelry. Um, which was made from the hair of the deceased in a way of both mourning and remembering the life of a loved one. Mourning jewelry is often distinguished by symbols of death, such as skulls, 
urns, weeping willow trees, or images of mourners like you see here. Next slide. They can also contain inscriptions with a name, date, or message about the departed, such as this pin that was made out of gold, hair, and with mother of pearl. Um, the mother of pearl um, often indicated the loss of a child. Next slide. But as I mentioned, this type of jewelry was um, often made from the hair of a living person. A father could have the hair of his wife woven into cufflinks or a watch chain, or a mother might have a brooch or a pair of earrings made from the hair of her children. It was a way of keeping a piece of your loved one with you at all times. And what's really fascinating about hair jewelry is that it tells us a lot about the cultural history of the period. Very few pieces of hair jewelry exist today that are made of gray or white hair. Growing old was really a privilege that not many were afforded. Next slide. We also have jewelry such as lockets uh, that contain pieces of hair. This uh, really beautiful French enameled locket is inscribed on the back to EGM, uh, Eliza Green Metcalf, who is also known as Eliza Radicke. She was the daughter of RISD's founder, Helen Adelia Rowe Metcalf, and she served as the president of RISD for almost two decades. The locket appears to have been a Christmas gift given to Eliza just a few months before she was married to Gustav Radeke in 1880. Whether it contains this lock of hair um, or whether this lock of hair was put in when it was given to her or she added it later is unknown. Next slide. When we think about how we want to grow our collections at the museum, we often look for gaps, whether it's in chronology or important makers, forms, materials, techniques that we don't have. Um, but I always knew that I wanted to bring more work by contemporary artists into the collection that honored our historic collections and made them feel relevant and accessible to our audiences. The history of hair jewelry in particular is as intriguing for what it contains as for what it leaves out. And that includes the stories of black hair. In 2020, I acquired Hair Necklace 4 Chain by Sonia Clark, which you can see here on the left. A trained textile artist, Clark's deep appreciation for craft propels her use of everyday objects, such as hair, to address identity politics, collective fortitude, and social justice. Hair Necklace 4 brings the power of black hair to the forefront created using both her own hair and the hair of her family and friends. Each lock weaves the literal DNA of a community together while also creating space for dialogue about the legacies of colonialism, violence, and the oppression that continues today against black bodies and black hair. Acquired in 2021, Melanie Bylinker's work returns to the singular individual as a focus this time with the artist herself, and in a way that pushes the boundaries of what is typically regarded as hair jewelry. Using strands of her own hair, Bylinker illustrates these tender self-portraits of everyday life, each one a memory of a place and time, much in the way the historic hair jewelry reminded the wearer of their loved one. Having these contemporary works has been so important for us in expanding the stories that we tell with our historic collections, and it makes the past that much more relevant to the present. Next slide. This recent acquisition, which is currently on view at the RISD Museum, speaks to rituals of mourning, but in a slightly different way. This is Lucy Jockel's B-Wing Lace Neck Piece. Lucy is a RISD alumna who graduated with her MFA in jewelry and metalsmithing in 2016. She creates wearable mementos from animal remains, such as bones, insect wings, um, and, and bees wings, like you see here, as a way to honor and grieve our, the loss of our non-human counterparts, while also exploring the ephemerality and fragility of the environment. Her use of bee wings in particular speaks to the vital importance and the threats to our bee population. 
Originally, I had planned to purchase a work from Lucy uh, that had already been made, but when I learned that the bees in RISD's various hives around campus did not survive the 2019-2020 winter, I came up with the idea of having Lucy create a special work for the museum that would honor the bees and connect to our historic collections. Next slide. Prior to this commission, as a student, Lucy had been utilizing the RISD Museum for inspiration, having made visits to our costume and textiles collection to view Victorian lace, she was drawn to it for its very intricate patterning. And the form of our neck piece was really inspired by these Dutch lace collars, such as the one that you see in the painting on the left. Next slide. Bee wing lace neck piece has really become a touchstone of our collection and a fantastic example that really illustrates how artists can work with our collection and draw inspiration from multiple sources while at the same time addressing topics that are ever present in our world. Next slide. The commission project with Lucy really became a model for how I wanted to engage with artists for special projects. Um, and that includes a commission that is currently underway with artist Valerie James, who graduated from RISD in 2019 with her MFA in jewelry and metalsmithing. While at RISD, Valerie worked as, at the museum as a conservation intern and played important roles in both the cleaning of objects and in educating visitors to the Gorham Silver Exhibition all about engraving. I was really thrilled um, at the opportunity to invite Valerie back to the museum to work on a commission for our collection. And through our collaboration, we settled on two unique pieces for the museum that she would make the forms and designs of which will draw inspiration from objects in our collection. Valerie was really drawn to these Gorham design drawings as inspiration for the shape of her necklace. And the final piece will be a compilation of various designs from platters and other serving dishes, which I think is really exciting. Next slide. And she's also planning to make a pair of earrings for us, the shape of which will be inspired by these Gorham fruit knives um, for their marvelous shape. And the engravings will also be a mix of imagery that's pulled from different Gorham objects. And um, oh, next slide. <clears throat> the, um, these are some recent in-process images that Valerie shared with me. When I asked Valerie to reflect on the commission process so far, she said, quote, developing this commission is allowing me to break out of my comfort zone, both in concepts of work and the raised technical challenges of engraving. Being a former resident of Providence and a RISD alum, it means so much to work with a collection that I've always found inspiring. One of the biggest challenges has been to develop my own style and voice through the lens of a historic precedent being able to both embrace and transform tradition. Working on these pieces has given me a much greater appreciation for how things used to be methodically designed and mulled over before the piece even began. And I've tried to follow through with the same sort of thinking, although I'm usually a much more intuitive with my work. I've always had a fascination with decorative objects and, the, and their agency in the home. The engraving used in the original Gorm collection has incredible storytelling capabilities, and I've been able to be much more illustrative with my own mark making. This new way of working for me um, is really exciting, and um, I'm, I'm excited to see how this will influence future bodies of my work." End quote. It has been such a treat to work with Valerie throughout this commission process, and I'm really happy to have Aaron here to uh, get a little bit more in depth about the commission process and his current project with RISD, um, what it's meant for his practice and how it's going. So with that, I'm gonna turn things over to Aaron. Yeah, thank you, Emily. Um, so let's just jump into it. My first inkling when RISD asked me about doing a possible piece for the collection was really trying to figure out 
um, how my work sat in it. And I think the same of Lucy and Les, um, Valerie in that engaging in a historical precedent has always been sort of top of mind for me as a jeweler. And in the works that I did uh, up to this point, uh, my piece is on the right, a piece from the museum collection is on the left. Um, both are what's called a parure, uh, which is a set of jewelry that individually can be worn and separately uh, be worn, but together also forms into one whole piece of jewelry. Um, and really what drove me in that work um, that work that Emily and I connected on uh, ahead of this uh, commission was this idea of being a queer individual and being an assembled uh, person of parts and that we sort of take from certain things, we take from certain languages, I take uh, from certain ways of acting really masculine and acting really, fe acting really feminine. Um, and you sort of go through spaces and, and adapt and I thought jewelry was a beautiful sort of metaphor for that, sort of deconstructing the pieces into their piece, like parts and pieces, and then reassembling them back into these sort of clown-like figurines. Um, and then to get really in depth on where a lot of this work came from was from a pretty traumatic queer experience that I had when I was a kid, um, when I was called sort of a queer clown and compared to John Wayne Gacy, who was a serial killer. Um, so as an individual who was queer, I had to sort of come into that understanding that that part of myself that most people were fine with, um, there were people in my life that really hated or vilified me and having to mitigate that and understand that in the jewelry that I'm making, I had these parts and pieces that existed next to each other. And my, like myself, I had those parts and pieces and depending on who's looking uh, is sort of depending on what you see. And I think in the Rizzi collection, especially these sets of jewelry, these beautiful pieces that are sort of like a collection of items really um, spoke to me and how to think about my work and how to think about coming into that collection and thinking about what I would make or, or why I would make something for the museum. Of course, it's great to be asked to make something for a museum, but I think the more, more important question for me was like, yeah, but what does it mean to do that? And I wanted to figure that out before actually saying yes. So that gets to the actual uh, commission. And this is uh, some excerpts from the proposal. The proposal was called Dino Bomb. Uh, and it's based off of this idea of making a toy that is a perer. So think um, Fabergé egg transformer is sort of the, the elevator pitch for it. And then this was the accompanying poem. So I'll go ahead and read that. Am I but parts put together haphazardly, some toiling in the sky, looking at my rump, my face, and my feet? Parts of a hole, a worn pair of shoes, or washed wool, parts attached to a skin. Look at me, wear these parts, toy with my mouth, take my tail, make me like you. So these are some of the first inspiration images that I proposed in, in this document. Uh, and it's this idea of a toy um, that I would want if I was a kid, but it's more of this idea of things that come apart, things that come together. So this dinosaur is really just an assembly of a tail, a lizard's tail that comes off and becomes a bracelet. Uh, its sneakers come off and become earrings. And then inside there will be a dino egg and it's yeah it's it's an extension of that body of work that emily and i connected on and it's about being an individual being a character being a caricature of something and how that caricature is really just um sort of all of these signifiers and symbols put together and like plopped on you sort of like a Miss Potato Head, and especially around Halloween, where right now everyone's taking on costumes and characters and being someone else of who, who they are. Uh, it's always an interesting question, I think, to ask who we are. Um, and I know we started to talk, talking about introducing ourselves, but like, does that actually show who we are? Or is what I'm showing you who I am something that I'm presenting to you as piece, pieces and parts that you need to consume? And this is just some inspiration images. I'm a millennial uh, 90s kid. 
and this dinosaur sort of popped up in Rugrats and it's, I don't know, Godzilla and T-Rex. It's just like a kid's toy and a boy's toy. It's always been pretty top of mind. And then these are some studio inspiration images. The one thing that was really fantastic about this experience so far is when we first start talking about the proposal and talking about what was going to happen, I initially wanted um, to make this piece of course, but I had sort of a caveat and I, I wanted it to be a part of a body of work too. So I didn't want to just make one piece and it be a flash in the pan, but I wanted to make a body of work um, that sat together. And that body of work really is um, about this whole idea of assembled parts. Um, so what, what sort of occurred because of the commission and doing this research and looking at what I was going to make is I found this book from my childhood and in it, it's, it's sort of like a, a crayon drawing of um, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I answer it in crayon uh, remarks, of course. And the first one was pineapple. And the second one was warrior. And then there's a wizard. And then there's a dinosaur. And then there's a fireman. And then there's a cheerleader and a princess. And all the things I wanted to be. And I just thought it was really fantastic to think that I understood what those symbols meant and the empowerment behind those symbols and that, those identities. Um, other than the pineapple, that's sort of the, the rogue in the group. But we are going to make a pineapple uh, figurine that completely disassembles. But all that to say is this dinosaur bomb kicked off that body of work, uh, which is going to premiere next fall. Um, but this commission is the first one in that series, really. And this is how to connect with us. And I think for the next part of the talk, what we're going to is do is some conversation back and forth. Um, so let me, there we go. Perfect. Can you hear me, Emily? Yeah. Great. Um, I know we prepared some questions, uh, so if you're okay with me just jumping in and starting, I would yeah. love to. Let's get, let's get into it. Yeah. So this is sort of a Q&A portion of the talk. We presented what we wanted to, and now it's more a conversational idea. Um, my first question for you, Emily, um, as someone who self-admittedly says they're a little new to the field, what, dry, what drew you into jewelry? What brought you to this field? I think that similar to decorative arts in general, there were always things that were around me that I was interested in. And I didn't really understand how to, you know, how to look at them, how to see them, you know, until I guess, you know, I, I, I moved from art history to decorative history of decorative arts and design. And I always like to say that when I first started learning about the history of art, I saw art completely differently. Mm -hmm. And when I started learning about the history of decorative arts, I saw the whole world differently. And I think that, That's you know, awesome. each, each aspect of the decorative arts that I've learned and I count jewelry in that, of course, um, has really opened my eyes to this new history. So my grandparents actually dealt in antique jewelry after my grandfather retired. And so we always had these really beautiful pieces around us. In fact, some of the most special pieces that I own came from my grandparents. And, you know, having, having this type of work in my life and then getting to the RISD Museum where we have this incredible collection of jewelry and it's almost like this hidden trove of, of, of wonders where, you know, nobody has really dived in to learn more about it, you know, made me that much more excited about getting in there and seeing what we have and figuring out what those stories are because mm -hmm. I have the stories of my own jewelry pieces, you know, where they came from and, um, you know, what they meant to my family, but it's really been exciting to dive into our collection and, and pull out those stories. And I've learned so much, you know, in the past couple of years about where they came from, who owned them, who wore them, you know, who loved them and who were made for people that they loved. And um, it's, it's really special. So I think that one of the things that I really drew me into jewelry was those personal stories and mm -hmm. histories. What about you? 
you want to talk a little bit more about jewelry? I know you, I know you did in your, in your. Yeah, no, I, I would, I would love to. Um, I'm I, something that you said really struck me too that you you see the world differently because of, of those kinds of objects. For me, um, it's relatively the same thing. I think jewelry has an amazing ability to connect people and it also has this wonderful ability to carry those stories. I've always thought that jewelry is one of the more complicated um, formats of art and complicated, not technically. What I usually say is um, jewelry like us is very complicated. Like we're all complicated beings um, and we're all messy. And that beauty and that messiness is really present in jewelry because it's connected to people, it's connected to lives, it lives with people, it lives through people, it goes across borders, it, it just like lives in people's lives really where art or painting um, or even drawings, they do live with people, but you don't wear them and they, you don't sort of pass them on and they don't, they can mark these really impactful moments, but jewelry is that object that marks these really like scintillating moments in one's life that can, and they can bring you back to these moments. So I think specifically what you're saying is exactly why I'm also interested in jewelry. Um, and I think because of that quality, I find it really freeing as an artist to work in the format of jewelry because it allows me to one, make really crazy things technically that are beautiful and fit in this historical precedent and like all the technical like, majesty that's in jewelry is amazing. But the more important thing is that my work gets to live with people. And I think that's the, like the beauty of it. And I, I, I think it's not that um, I want my jewelry to all go um, or like live and be sold and be purchased. And it's great that my piece is going to live in the museum it's going to have its own life with curators who are going to touch it and experience it and people after you they're going to experience it but i really really love when my work lives with people i think it's uh i'm really excited for the time that i'm like 75 and someone sends me an email and it's like this this dinosaur lost a sneaker <laughs> like i think that will be my favorite email i've ever received in my life and i i, I love those kinds of things that that will be a, a communication for a future curator. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the follow up to that question then is um, about this commission process, right? And RISD is doing something that I think, uh, as an artist working in the field of jewelry, is pretty revolutionary. It's not something that's very common you're actively seeking out younger artists and trying to support them through um, getting them to make work for the collection. And I guess the question is, what drives you to engage with artists in this way, rather than what museums traditionally do, which is wait for people to sort of get into their golden year careers and start collecting them or purchase them then slowly from buys of work. What you're doing is really kind of, um, I don't know, just not, it's not typical, it's not typical. Yeah, yeah, um, it's it's not. And I think it's a really exciting way that we're able to work at the museum. I remember years ago when I started here, somebody said one of the things that they like most about the RISD Museum is that, you know, we're, we're collecting things that not everyone else is collecting. Yeah. You know, we're kind of, we're kind of following our own path. And when I think about, you know, engaging with artists and bringing work into the collection, there's a way to do it hand in hand where, you know, we're acquiring work from an artist, but we're also building a relationship with them. Mm -hmm. And in thinking about the ways that museums can support artists and museums can be both collectors and supporters and actively engage with the people that we want to bring into our collections. I think commissions are a really incredible way to do that. Um, I was telling someone recently that, you know, it's not a one size fits all process. And it's definitely something that 
I'm sort of learning as I go with each artist, you know, what kind of support everyone needs in this process, you know, how hands-on they want me to be, um, <laughs> you know, how many times we have conversations about the projects and, you know, and, and the timelines and how things are developing. Um, and I think that it, it takes, it takes a really, um, collaborative pair of people to yeah. be able to engage in this process and it's really a lot of trust that is also you know happening between the institution and the artist you know we are putting a lot of trust into the artist that you know we're buying into this idea this thing that isn't made and you know that you're gonna create something that represents you in the best way possible. And you're also trusting me that I'm gonna be able to support you throughout this process and you know, recognize that maybe that thing that you proposed isn't actually the, the thing that we get in the end. And that's okay because yeah. you know your work and your process and how you want to bring this object into the world. And it's my job to support that. Um, so I'm really grateful that, you know, the museum has given me this opportunity to work with artists like yourself um, and to, you know, hopefully create a relationship that lasts beyond this commission. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I can say from my perspective as an artist on the receiving end, I'm I'm still kind of just like flabbergasted. Um, and that in a way that's like, oh my God, but in a way it's like, it's a really big honor to have the RISD Museum put that trust in me, especially where I am in my career. Like I'm a pretty young artist. <laughs> um, and I remember we talked about it, but one of the things that really that this does for me or it did for me was push me into accepting and challenging my work even more because of that support. It's as though I had the board at RISD cheering me on, basically going like, yeah, keep going. And I remember you asked me sort of like, if, if you could, what would you make? That's sort of like the craziest thing you've thought about. And I immediately knew. <laughs> and I was like, this thing. And you're like, okay we should try that. And I was like, what? We can do that? <laughs> That's amazing. Um, and not that it's like, I don't know. As an artist, uh, money can be a barrier, but I think the bigger barrier for me in my practice is really that, um, that support, that like your peer support or the support of those new ideas that are hard to have you accept. It's, it's funny, I talk to people about this all the time. The idea that like, I'm my biggest critic in that I have a hard time accepting these changes in my work more so than other people do. People are like cheering me on being like, this is awesome, this is great. And I'm over here being like, uh, I'm not sure, I'm just not sure yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, I think the big shift happened because of this commission right after that body of work is sort of like I got confidence in, in my practice that, uh, not that I hadn't had to that point, but it was like a re-energization, re-energy re-energizing mm -hmm. my practice yeah I'm so happy to hear it yeah you know you could have said no <laughs> I could have said no <laughs> I took a long time to say yes <laughs> yeah. yeah so I think um one of the questions I let me make sure this is the correct question yeah I think you said it earlier about every artist is sort of different in how they approach this commission. Can you speak to that a bit more? Of sort of like what the difficulties are, what the successes are in that process? Mm -hmm. And like all free to say like artists are difficult, I'm difficult, everybody. Like like anyone on this call who's an artist or watching this who's an artist and they're like, I'm not difficult, you're lying to yourself, we're all difficult. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I would say so, so we've only had two, I've only had two commissions projects completed so far. I have two in process and I have a few things that are upcoming that, <laughs> that everyone will learn more about eventually. But I would say that, you know, um, the biggest difference in, you know, working with 
different artists is one, everybody is working in a very different way with different materials um, and has, you know, a different vision for how they want their work to, to ultimately live. And when I first engaged in conversations with Lucy and we were thinking about, you know, the B-wing necklace and how it might look, um, you know, she provided a few different ideas and, you know, we kind of went with one idea and then, um, and then I didn't hear anything from her for a really <laughs> long time. Um, and if Lucy, if you're listening to this, that's totally fine. Um, I do the same thing. Amazing. Um, but, you know, I think that was one of those things where like, you know, she had the idea, you know, she had the okay, and then she just like went with it. And I really love and appreciate that because when she finally sent me that email that was like, the piece is done. I thought, oh my God, it's done. <laughs> and, and she sent me the image. I was just completely blown away because I had this idea in my mind of, you know, the type of design that she was going to make. I imagined that she would probably make some alterations to the design once she actually started constructing it because we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of minuscule b-wings put together with minuscule mm -hmm. amounts of glue taking you know hours and hours on end um and i figured that once she got started with that process she was just gonna go with it so seeing the final object i was just so blown away by it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was what I expected and it was like even more than I expected. Yeah. And I had this moment of being like, wow, this, <laughs> this, you know, this object has like, has come to life in a way that I didn't even expect. And I think that was one of the most exciting things for me about working with her and, and engaging in this commission process is like, you know, I had this idea of what it was going to be and it completely exceeded all expectations. So, um, so the bar is very high. <laughs> yes. Yes, it is. Yeah. For everyone. Um, and you know, some of the artists that I, that I've been working with since like, you know, you and I have checked in every couple months and mm -hmm. we've had these conversations about how do these ideas develop? Like, how do they evolve? And is it okay that they evolve? I remember, you know, you asking me, is it okay if it looks a little bit differently than what you initially designed? And, um, you know, of course I was like, yes, <laughs> you know, unless, unless the dinosaur, you know, becomes a flamingo, yeah. that, that might be <laughs> something that, you know, we would want to talk about, but yeah. um, I think, I, I know your work. I've seen your work. Um, I know what you're capable of. And I, I really trust you in this process to create the object the way that you feel like it needs to be created. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so whatever amount of, you know, conversation and discussion, you know, feedback you want to have from me, I am so happy to give, but I'm also you know, will acknowledge that you're the creator of this artwork and yeah. um, and you're the one that is going to bring it to life and knows how you want it to be. And yeah. and I'm just here to support that. Yeah, I, I remember sending you um, that email or I think maybe a text message. But I, for me, I come from two, two schools of thought, basically. I am an artist, but I also work very much in product development. So when someone says, um, here are these funds to go make this thing, I go, that's a one-to-one -one relationship. Okay, got that. Um, but yeah, as I was going through the idea and it was evolving, um, I wanted the dinosaur to sit instead of stand. <laughs> and I thought that was just radical. <laughs> and I was like, this is, they're going to reject. This is not going to work. I can't do this. Um, and I, of course, if you would have said no, it would have been like, okay, you're right. I'm going to keep on going with this thing and I will make it the way it needs to be made. Got it. Um, but that, that amount of flexibility, I think, is even commendable from a museum perspective. Um, often I, or yeah, often I have in my 
head that museums are pretty rigid or strict with what they're doing, why they're doing it, and how they're doing it. And that kind of empathy or compassion or understanding of the artistic process was like a welcome relief. Um, in my studio practice, I'm a bit more of a chaos child. Um, where I'm just kind of like a weird scientist working at things, making things happen, moving, taking a lot of time to think through stuff. Um, and then somehow it like pops into being. Uh, and that can be frustrating for people. My gal is especially, sorry, Stefan, if you ever watch this. Um, but it was, it was a welcome relief to know that that was okay, that my practice was fine. Like that's normal. And I was like, oh, okay, cool, good. Good for good. Can you talk a little bit about how you're approaching the commission and how, you know, you've kind of moved through this process of troubleshooting mm -hmm. and trial and error and, you know, what's, what's, what's keeping you going? Yeah, I think um, what keeps me going throughout all of my work period is this sort of drive to find um, this thing that I haven't found yet. And it's really hard to put my finger on it, but it's sort of like that curiosity part of my practice where if it gets too boring too quick, it, I stop. I, I no longer am interested. So I always have to have some either technical thing, conceptual thing, random thing happening. Um, and that means I'm experimenting a lot or challenging things or fabricating things, making things that aren't the dino bomb to then think about the dino bomb. Um, an, an example is um, I was teaching at Penland this past summer, and I was um, showing the students sort of how I use enamels, because I use both um, leaded enamels and unleaded enamels. And for the enamelists, um, or, the not, or for the non-enamelists, those two glasses don't usually mix when you fire them. They don't mix very well. They're not friendly. Um, so you end up having this weird um, texture that can happen. I did it uh, to show them what not to do and then I liked it and I was like this is the perfect dinosaur uh, texture skin texture and I have the sample right here uh, so it's like this weird green dotted texture and then the dark green are just more and more layers of the dark green on top but basically what's happening, um, to get very nerdy, because you asked me what drives me, um, is that the leaded enamel is being fired um, on top. No, opposite way. The unleaded enamel is being fired on top of the leaded enamel. And basically, one enamel is moving much faster than the other one. So things are kind of like separating. So it's kind of like curds and whey is what's mm -hmm. happening to the glass. And that's what creates that texture. So it's really bad if you're trying to get a good finish and like a nice flat finish and like keep things working and not have bubbles and stuff. Um, but for me, it was like an aha moment where I don't have to paint that on by hand, which is something I was really contemplating doing. Of like painting skin, like lizard skin texture onto this dino bomb because I, I knew it needed some sort of dimensional element. And this has led me down a path now like, oh, what color combinations can I do now? What can I actually do with dimension? Can I make a part of these um, scales that I'm making on the Dino Bomb darker than lighter? Um, so that is sort of what drives me to make my work. Through the commission process, I think it's just a lot of excitement is what's driving me. Uh, it's pretty crazy to be able to make this thing that is gonna be, I don't know, like a behemoth object. It's a, it's a weird, transformers that's made out of silver gold enamel uh, stones um, so it's like a, a Fabergé work that I'm working on but it's, it's very much a, um, a toy uh, that's a piece of jewelry so I, I think it's just really exciting that's what's driving me to make it and then yeah the curiosity I'm, I'm always that person who's I don't know constantly looking for the other thing but like piques my interest. I'm terrible at making several of the same thing. Um, I'm really, really bad at that, just mentally. So this is a great project because it's like, we're just stacking challenge on challenge on challenge. The tail itself is um, an art articulating tail that becomes a bracelet and having to technically figure that out 
I've had to consult with like a CAD engineer, a mechanical engineer, an architect, and like trying to figure out how to get something that's six inches long tube to bend completely uh, and then latch and then also attach to the dyno bomb has been just like stupidly hard. Um, but it's fun. It's really fun to, to do those things. <laughs> I remember when I was looking at images of the of the the proposed piece um, with some other people from the museum. I was like, "This is this is really complicated. Like, I don't know how he's gonna do it, but I know he's gonna do it." <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm gonna do it. It's that's, I think that's the I think if that's the tagline that my galleries would probably ever use to describe <laughs> me is like, "He's gonna get it done. He'll get it done." <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how, but yeah, I, I like that. I like sort of jumping into the unknown with an idea that's crazy and figuring it out. Yeah, I love that. We're all, we're all here to do complicated things. Yep, yep, <laughs> complicated people. <laughs> yeah, I know we talked a, a little bit about this, um, but this, this came up recently uh, when, I, when I had a group of RISD students in for a class, an object class, and we were talking about you know, uh, decorative arts objects in the museum, especially, you know, uh, more so than paintings or sculptures or works on paper, things that were made to be used, things that were chairs yeah. that were made to be sat in, teacups were made to be drunk out of, um, and jewelry was meant to be worn. Mm -hmm. And there's always this like piece of me, especially when I'm working with a contemporary artist and we're creating a new object that has to reconcile these feelings of this is going to go into the museum and live here forever. And that's amazing. But also it will never be worn and used and, and touched and displayed on the body um, in the way that the rest of the artist's work lives in the world mm -hmm. and kind of reconciling that. And I know you and I had this conversation where, um, you know, I, I was, I was feeling a little bit, sad that this incredible object is never going to like, I'll never get to put it on. Yeah. <laughs> um, or, you know, no one will ever get to like put it on and wear it around. And it just gets to be this incredible treasure that lives in the museum and, you know, relies on us to activate it and to bring it out, to show it to students, to put it on display, maybe create a really amazing video showing it being taken apart and put back together. Yeah. Um, but especially for jewelry that is so intimate and so personal, you know, thinking about how it lives in the museum, um, is, uh, is, is, is something that I think about all the time, mm -hmm. you know, how objects will, will be, I don't know. Do you, does that, does that, you know, make you feel any type of way when you think about how this piece is going to be in the museum? Um, it makes me very much want to hide Easter eggs in the piece. <laughs> like that, I, I don't know. I'm the artist that kind of goes, I, I love making for any situation. Usually it's the opposite problem, right? Is that we're trying to make jewelry as our, our jewelers that's wearable. Um, and this is you asking me not to worry about that where I go, thank God. <laughs> um, but of course I'm gonna, it ha it's gonna be wearable and it's going to be comfortable to wear in, in certain parts. But the idea of it just living in the museum makes me really just want to start hiding things in it. Uh, and that's like, it's a thing that like, maybe you'll take it apart once, your colleague will take it apart once and someone else will take it apart once and each of you find just something different. Like there's a detail that's different or like I, I hide something somewhere on this thing. I don't know how, um, but I, I'm, what that immediately makes me want to do is do that. Okay, that's amazing. That's an exciting prospect. Yeah, because I, I don't know. It's the idea of making a piece for a museum makes me just want to treat it like a treasure trove. Then, it's like, okay, let's just hide Easter eggs in it. Let's just hide things in it that are very specific. Or um, I remember I made this ring for a dear um, collector friend, and we were talking about this, and she was talking about Dakota rings, and that is what. Um, mm -hmm. comes to mind where I go, is this like a decoder object? Like, can we, 
could this object be like a compass that I can make that you guys have no idea it's a compass, but some somewhere down the road, this will be like the way to find things out about my practice. I'm that, yeah, I'm obviously a child stuck in a man's body or I just want to have fun. So yeah, I, I don't have problems with things living in museums. I, I think it's a function of the work or a function of being an artist is to understand where the work lives and where it's going to live. And then putting yourself conceptually in the place where it makes the most sense how that object's going to live there. Um, I don't, yeah, it's like myself. I can't dictate where I live all the time and I can't dictate to my environment how it should treat me. So I need to modify myself to the environment. I think that very much of my jewelry. So I'll, I'll probably, now that I have thought about this, we'll have to <laughs> make a couple amendments to this object. <laughs> <laughs> all right. But we also oh. talked about like the box, the how to store it. Like, does it sit in a box? Does it exist in a display case um, sort of thing? Well, this is part of the process. It's, it's, it's not over yet. No, it's not over yet. <laughs> um, my time is almost up. I don't know if we have any other questions. Um. Let me... Actually... I did, we, we did talk about this a little bit. And I wonder if the answer changed. I know that you look at a lot of jewelry, both antique and contemporary. Um, are there any pieces out there that were sort of like the first piece of jewelry that you saw that, what, that you were like, wow, that is amazing. That sort of like started this trajectory. Does that piece of jewelry exist for you? Hmm. That's a really good question. Um, I don't know if that one piece of jewelry exists for me. I think in my head, it's a collection of all the jewelry pieces that I own and all the things that I, I see when I'm antiquing and mm -hmm. Um, and visit in museums. People always ask me what my favorite object in the museum is. And I'm not, uh, maybe it's my sign. I'm not the type of person who can just choose one thing. Yeah. Like, I have everything. <laughs> yeah. Um, and my brain is just a library of all the things that I've ever, you know, seen. So, so maybe, maybe, maybe somewhere in there, there's one thing, but, um, I don't know what it, when it comes to jewelry, I just, I have all of these like important things that live in my, in my memory that, um, that, you know, kind of served to inspire me to, to do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what are, um, yeah, I, I'm, I can't press on that answer because we don't know. I'm the same way. We're both Aquarius. So this is the hard part. Yeah. If someone asked me that question, I'd be like, I don't know either. Um, I, I, I always say that my, like, my favorite thing is whatever I'm working on right now. Yeah. Um, which is true. So, you know, right now my two favorite things are wallpaper because um, I'm, I'm working on our, our collection of historic wallpaper and, and jewelry. So those are, those are the two things that I am deep into and really excited about. And, um, and I'll just, I'll just point to this because um, I know someone's going to, someone's yeah. going to really know about this. This is, this is a, a, a brooch that was made by the Gora manufacturing company in Providence, Rhode Island. And, one of my, you know, favorite things to do whenever I move to a new place, because I've moved around my whole life, um, is to really steep myself in the history and traditions of that place and collect things that are associated with it. And what what better thing than Gorham Silver? That's really true. To, to have it with me. Yeah. yeah. Well, this has been really fun. And I've loved learning more about the commission process and your practice from, from you and how this commission has, you know, changed and influenced the way that you're thinking about your practice and how, you know, these commissions are really important for me and I think the institution and a great model for what we can do to support, you know, emerging artists. Yeah, I do feel like you're kind of a trendsetter right now. And the museums haven't picked up on this yet, but I'm very excited for them too, because I think it's a incredibly intelligent model for sustainable artists and craftspeople's practices. Uh, so thank you for 
thinking of me and also taking the time to talk today. It's been lovely. Trendsetting. You you heard it here first. Yep. Yep. I said it. I said it. <laughs> All <laughs> right. right. Well, thanks for watching, everyone, and um, we hope that you connect with us um, in, in all the ways that we're available to connect with. Thank you, everybody. Bye.